Welcome to Calculus 1, Chapter 2, Section 5. Let's talk about continuity. This particular topic is going to follow very nicely from 2.4. And we're going to be using slides prepared for Stewart's Calculus 8th edition. And then we'll pop over to a web assigned homework assignment that I created and I want to get right into this definition which tells us that a function is continuous at a particular number if the limit for our function as x approaches a particular value is equal to the function evaluated at that particular value. That's what's going to make our function continuous. And we're going to see graphical examples of this, which will help to make that more clear. We've talked about one-sided limits, so we can bring those in on this conversation also. A function is continuous from the left. If, as our function approaches from the left, we're approaching the same value for which our function is defined at that value and very similarly as we approach from the, from the right if that limit is equal to the function's actual value at that point so up until now when we talk about limits we've said or I've said over and over again I'm not concerned with what's actually happening when x equals a except now when we talk about continuity we're very much concerned with what's actually happening on our function when x is equal to a. So a little bit of a shift there, or at least adding that very specific point back in to our examination of the function. And definition three tells us that a function is continuous on an interval if it's continuous at every number in the interval. And we could check our endpoints using continuity from the left and from the right. So definition number one requires three things. Our function has to be defined for a particular value and the limit has to exist as our x value approaches in this case and frequently as we use lowercase a and the limit and that function value have to be the same. We're also familiar with some different types of discontinuity. Asymptotes are a primary one, and the secondary one that we see are holes. A hole is a type of a discontinuity. And our function is discontinuous at a particular value if our function is not continuous. So if we test for continuity and it fails, we will say that our function is discontinuous. So let's look at this illustration. This has a couple of examples of discontinuity involving holes. So as you can see here, as our function is approaching from the left, approaching a point where x is equal to a, let's say that our y value is approaching, just so we can have a different value, let's say it's three. And as our function is approaching, an x value of 1 from the right, we're approaching a y value of 3. The problem is, is that our function at x equals 1 is not actually defined. So we can't say that our limit is equal to, <clears throat> let me write it down, we can't say that the limit of our function as x approaches 1 is equal to our function evaluated at 1 because we can't even evaluate this function at 1. It's undefined. So because we can't say that these two things are equal, our function is not continuous at or when x equals 1. Similarly, um, if we move over to an x value of 5, as our functions coming in from the right and coming in from the left, they do appear or it does appear to be approaching maybe a, again a y value of 3. In this case our function is defined for an x value of 5 
except that corresponding y value is way up here, maybe at uh, seven or eight. So if I can just modify this original statement that I wrote in red, just as a time saver, we'll use a different color because we're saying that x is approaching five. So both of these, both sides of this equation do have a numerical value, except that the left side of that equation is equal to three and the right side is equal to, I'm guessing eight. And because those are not equal to each other, we would say that the function is discontinuous at x equals five. Certainly, um, when x is equal to positive three, the left-hand side of an equation, so let me switch colors again, let's erase the fives out of there, let's get rid of those, and when our x value is approaching three, <clears throat> well, I don't even have to examine f of three, because the left-hand side of this equation the limit doesn't exist because as we approach from the left our limit is approaching a different value than as we approach from the right so we don't even need to get into calculating f of three because we've already sort of failed the test on the left hand side of this equation so again we would say that the function is discontinuous at x equals three so a discontinuity at one because there's a hole or a break Really, it's discontinuous because the function is not defined there. We're seeing that when a equals three, there's a discontinuity, but it's a different kind. Um, that would be maybe a jump discontinuity because all of a sudden our y value changes rapidly. And at x equals five or a equals five, it is discontinuous because the limit does not equal f of five. And it's very, very nice when we have the opportunity to work with the graphs of a function. But occasionally, we're only going to be given the actual algebraic depiction of the function. We won't immediately have the graph to work with. So is there a way that we can tell if these particular functions are continuous or not? And in fact, this first one, and because these have already been typed out for us, uh, I'm not going to do a lot of handwriting on this one, but these are some really good examples. So let's look through these together. In option A, you might think, well, clearly there's going to be a discontinuity, and it's probably going to be a vertical asymptote, because when x equals 2, our denominator would equal 0, division by 0, not good, right? So this function is not even defined when x equals 2. and and you're right, except that it's not a vertical asymptote, because if we were to func uh, if we were to factor the numerator of this function, we would get x plus one times x minus two. <clears throat> Denominator is x minus two. These x minus twos would cancel. So does that mean that our function is continuous because we can get rid of that problem in the denominator? It's not it still isn't continuous. In fact, this function in part a is not defined for x equals two because it would cause division by zero. You were right there, except it doesn't show up as an asymptote. Because the x minus two in the denominator can be canceled out, we call this a removable discontinuity. And graphically, this would show up as a hole in our graph when x is equal to positive two. But that uh, inability to use an x value of two because it would cause division by zero is a clear indicator that our function is not even defined when x equals two, so we could not examine continuity when x is equal to two. Not defined, so not continuous at two. See, that's why I should stick with the pre-written notes because they're much more concise, but sometimes it's nice to hear it phrased differently. In part b, we've got one over x squared is the majority of our function, except when x is equal to zero, the function is being defined as equaling one. And in order to 
examine continuity here, we'd have to take a closer look because this function is definitely not defined when x equals zero because it would cause division by zero. So maybe the fact that we have this additional definition here would sort of fill in the gap. And let's see if maybe we're given, I forget if we're given graphical depictions of these. Yeah, so here on the right hand side, let's zoom in on it, we're seeing that piecewise function from part B. And even though the function is being defined in the second piece of our piecewise function, so our function is defined everywhere, we still, as we're coming in from the left and as we're coming in from the right, our slope is going up rapidly toward positive infinity. So you could say that the limit as x approaches zero is equal to positive infinity. However, f of zero does not equal positive infinity. So there's still a discontinuity here sort of with an asymptote that's been substituted by a point. So our function is defined everywhere, however, we still have discontinuity. And here the author is saying that even though f of zero is defined, as I mentioned, the limit, which is equal to positive infinity, does not equal, uh, oh sorry, um, I don't actually like this statement. Uh, the limit as x approaches zero, I like the right hand side of this, because the limit as x approaches zero here um, equals positive infinity, and in fact on the left hand side I would just write in the fact that f of zero, which we saw is equal to one, the way that the function is defined, does not equal positive infinity. And if we glance back at the definition, the limit as you approach that x value, in part b we were looking at an x value of zero, the limit as you approach that value needs to equal the function as defined at that value. Positive infinity does not equal zero. So that was the, the indicator to me that the function was not continuous. Part C looks a lot like part A, except our function is here being defined for us when x is equal to two. And the question is, does that uh, point that has coordinates two comma one, right? This is the x coordinate, this is the y coordinate one. Does two comma one fill in the gap in our graph? And let's go down and see the graphical interpretation of that first. So you can see the hole that's happening naturally based on the first part of the piecewise function and as a result originally we did not have continuity because there was a hole there but now we've got the function defined for all values of x except this y value does not sort of plug, plug the hole so to speak. Now what should the y value if we wanted to realize a continuous function here, we would have to change this y value. And what would we change it to? Well, as we saw, this numerator, when we factored it, turned into x plus 1 times x minus 2. And then the x minus 2 canceled out with the denominator. So it sort of results in a function that looks like y equals, or f of x equals, x plus 1. And it should be that when we have an x value of 2, we should have a y value of 3. So if this 3 appeared here instead of a 1, then we could say that our function is continuous. However, still not continuous. And then part D, the original function that was given to us, we don't have to scroll back up because it's right here for us, 
This is called the greatest integer function. And when you graph this unusual function, this is what it looks like. And the greatest integer function does something unique. When you plug in a number like 1.5, which is not an integer, this function sort of just trims off the decimal point. So if we look closely at the graph, if we were using an x value of 1.5, we come up here, you, you chop the 0.5 off of the end of our x coordinate and you end up with an x value of one. And when x is actually equal to one, which is an integer, you chop off the 0, 0.0, so to speak, and you still get the one. So the greatest integer function returns the largest integer that's less than or equal to your input value. And it gives us this graph clearly not continuous. We could come up with a lot of examples of why that one's not continuous. All right, so that is an examination of four different instances of discontinuity. We talked about removable discontinuity uh, in part B, where our curve was climbing up the y-axis. There we go, it came up the y-axis. Um, and then even when we tried to define a point that was sort of on that vertical asymptote, this is sometimes referred to as infinite discontinuity. So that was a vertical asymptote. And in part D, those, uh, and in part B actually, uh, those sort of rapid changes in Y coordinate are often referred to as jump discontinuities because of that rapid change in Y value. Uh, let's see, verifying the continuity. Of Convenient use next term to show how to. So, uh, another way to examine continuity or try to determine continuity is to sort of build up your functions based on simpler ones. And we've seen a lot of this in our conversations about checking limits or evaluating limits that the limit of a sum is equal to the sum of the limits or the difference of the limits. And we've factored a constant value out of a limit statement and we've looked at the product of limits and the quotient of limits as long as the denominator wasn't heading towards zero. So because continuity involves very much an examination of the limit applied to the function for a particular value, it's not a big surprise that we're seeing these in order to help the process of determining continuity. So if f and g are continuous, then f plus g, f minus g, a constant value times either one of those functions or the product of the functions is still going to be continuous, as is the quotient of the function, except for the values where the denominator would equal zero. We should still have continuity. Theorem number five, we mentioned a long time ago, now it seems that every polynomial or any polynomial is continuous everywhere. In other words, it's continuous on, and check out this weird symbol here. This is the set of real numbers. In other words, all real numbers. In other words, using interval notation, all the values from negative to positive infinity. A rational function like f of x over g of x, that's what rational means, fractional. Uh, a rational function like f of x over g of x is continuous wherever it's defined. In other words, wherever the denominator does not equal zero. Um, a little overkill on on this um, this is the volume the function or the formula for the volume of a sphere it's a polynomial four thirds is a constant pi is a constant and you've got your variable being raised to the third power so surely it's going to be continuous um, negative 16 feet per second squared is uh, acceleration due to gravity in a vacuum as measured in feet per second squared. Uh, so this is a function for the height of a ball in feet, t seconds 
into its flight path. Uh, again, it's another polynomial, so no surprise that that one is going to be continuous. And then there are our trig functions. If you picture for a moment the graph of the sine or the cosine function, you can picture this wave that goes on and on to the left and to the right forever. And those are nice, smooth, continuous curves. There's no jumps in y values. There's no holes. So those two functions, <clears throat> excuse me, sine and cosine, are continuous functions. We run into a little bit of a problem with tangent, however, because tangent is equal to sine divided by cosine. And cosine of x does, with some frequency, equal zero. So our tangent function is continuous everywhere that it's defined. And it's not defined for the x values that would cause cosine to equal zero. And when does that happen? That happens at pi over two, plus or minus, integer multiples of pi. And I believe we get to see that written out for us here. Right, so at pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, and the negative versions of those um, forever. So we keep adding or subtracting those integer multiples of pi. We see uh, vertical asymptotes. So whether you want to call that a jump discontinuity or an infinite discontinuity, they're definitely problematic, those x values. But our function's not even defined. Uh, the tangent function is not even defined for those values, so the tangent function is continuous everywhere else. So types of functions that are continuous at every number in their domain, in other words, everywhere that they are defined, we do still have a nice list of, X, or of functions that are not going to cause us too much trouble. The polynomials, those are all over the place. Rational functions, we see a lot of those. We even just saw sine over cosine, which is a rational function that involves trigonometric functions. Um, roots, like the square root function, I think we've seen that recently where it arcs out to the right. right? That, that function is continuous everywhere, starting at zero and moving off to the right. Exponential functions and their inverse functions, the logarithmic functions, and the inverse trigonometric functions. That's nice. And then another way that we end have, have seen in our mathematical education um, is function composition, like fog notation, f of g of x. And that's another way that we can combine functions and examine functions. And let's go in and look at this theorem a little bit closer here. If f is continuous at a point b, and g, the limit of g of x as x approaches a, is equal to b, so we're sort of filling in the gap there, uh, then we can say that the limit as x approaches a of f of g of x is equal to b. In other words, because this might make it more clear for you, so this might take a little bit of getting used to, but we're going to see an example where we can look at this a little more closely. f is continuous at b. And our function g of x is going to spit out a b value when, as our x value is approaching some other number. All right, and that's, that's not a big surprise. We've done that before, where you plug in something to the inner function, and it gives you a value, and then you take that new value and you plug it into the outer function. So that's not as foreign to you as it may sound like it is. But that might be a theorem that you want to write down or 
I would write it down. To be able to refer to that one again later, I think it's going to be helpful. And then theorem 9, we're seeing another composition function. So let's see if we can tell what the difference is between these two. Theorem 8 is reasonable because if x is close to a, then g of x is close to b. And since f is continuous at b, if g of x is close to b, then our composite function should have an output value that jives with uh, f being defined at b. So g is continuous at a, and f is continuous at g of a. So, right, so if g is continuous at a, I'm inside theorem 9 now, and f is continuous at g of a, remember g of a is a y value. So let's, let's use what we've been hearing so far. g is continuous at a. What does that mean? It means that there's an x coordinate, and as we're approaching that x value, can I get myself to be able to do this? As we're approaching that x value from the left, and as we're approaching the x value from the right, we're approaching some particular point that has a y value, and the function's actually defined at that point with that same y value. That's a lot of information packed into this one little statement that says if g is continuous at a. All right, so that's a lot of information. And f is continuous at some other input value. Right, g of a <clears throat> might be equal to 5. And if f is continuous at 5, then maybe f of 5 is equal to negative 2. So we're seeing how the function composition causes us to work with two different y values. Now, if both of those statements are true, g is continuous at a and f is continuous at g of a, then the composite function f of g of x will equal f of g of x at that point a. And the limits are going to be approaching that same output value, f of g of a. So we will have continuity. Difficult to envision these things, talking about them so generally. So for sure, that's why we're going to see some examples. And then there's the intermediate value theorem. This is a big one. And you probably saw this in an algebra class when you were having conversations about roots or zeros of a function. And I believe we get to see a nice depiction of this. We do, except it doesn't pertain to zeros. So let me um, let me draw just one quick little diagram here. If parabolas, surely we're all very familiar with. So if I had a parabola that looked like this, and it crossed my x-axis at one and at three, I could say that perhaps this function is equal to f of x minus 1 times x minus 3. Now where did I come up with that? If my x value is equal to 1, it would cause this entire function to equal 0. So an input value of 1 would give us an output value of 0, and we would be able to plot the point 1 comma 0. And since it has a y value of 0, that would be an x-intercept. And there it is on our x-axis, 1 comma 0. Same thing goes for plugging in an x value of 3. That would cause our function to equal 0, and it gives us another x-intercept. So that's how I was able to, to design that function so quickly. Now, what does that have to do with the intermediate value theorem? Here it is. If I asked you, does my function f of x have an x-intercept, or a zero, between x equals zero and x equals two. Well, you're looking at the graph, so you would say, well, sure, it does. I can see, there's the x-intercept. It sure has one. Well, how else could I determine that? 
The answer is, sorry, the answer is if you plug in an x value of 0 into your function and you find that f of 0 is equal to a positive number and then you plug in the number 2 into your function and you find that f of 2 is equal to a negative number. If your function's continuous, then at some point in time, going from positive down to negative must have put you through a point that had a y value of 0. So often, that's the application, at least early on, of the use of um, the intermediate value theorem. Now you could use this test instead of just crossing from a positive number to a negative number and, and inferring that that means that you must have passed through zero. You could, you could be checking to see if you're passing through some other y value than zero. Right, so if I want to know if there's a point where uh, maybe I'm starting down here and I'm finishing up here and I'm wondering, is my function going to pass through a point that has a y value of n? I could make that determination by plugging in this x coordinate and getting a y value that's lower than n and then plugging in this x coordinate and getting a y value that's larger than n and therefore I could conclusively say that at some point between those x values, I'm going to run into a y value of n. Does that always work? If your function's continuous on that interval, then yes, you can say that. <clears throat> And here's a better illustration of what I was just saying. In this case, with an x value of a, we have a y value that's up here, f of a. And at b, an x value of b, we're at this point down here that has a y value of f of b. This is a y value. This is a y value. If you've gone from a y value above n to a y value that's below n, then you must have passed through a y value of n. Again, is that always the case? Only if the function is continuous can we say that with certainty. It is important that the function f in theorem 10 be continuous. This is all about continuity. The intermediate value theorem is not true in general for discontinuous functions, so we must be mindful of the <clears throat> sort of status of continuity of our function. Uh, this is a, an illustration of what I was saying about starting out below the x-axis and finishing above the x-axis. Then at some point in the middle, you must have crossed over the x-axis. Is that always true? Very good. Only if your function's continuous. This talks about how our computers and graphing calculators are using that sort of intermediate value theorem in order to make some assumptions or uh, get a better idea of where it should be drawing its dots. All right, uh, I'm gonna pause real quick and the next time I see you, we'll be looking at a homework assignment. And here we are looking at a web assign homework assignment that's going to give us some example problems to talk about continuity. And the first problem says that a function f is continuous everywhere. What can we say about that graph? Does it have a hole? Does it have a jump? Does it have a vertical asymptote? Or none of those? I'm going to leave it up to you, knowing that the function is continuous, to decide whether or not the function has any of those features.
The second question is kind of an applied question, and it's talking about the tolls that are charged on a particular road. And depending on what time of day you're driving on this road, the cost of the toll is different. And they do this in um, a lot of different areas in order to try to moderate the amounts of traffic. So if they can possibly make it cost prohibitively expensive for you to be driving your vehicle maybe into a city during a particular hour, then you'll end up with, or the city will end up with fewer vehicles. And this is... Uh, an approach that's used in large cities in many countries around the world. I'm pretty sure that London implemented something like this in order to cut down on traffic and smog that was collecting. Anyway, in order to approach this question, my recommendation would be to, because the question right there, you're, you're being given the situation in this problem, and then you're given four different multiple choice options, you could take some different times of day and plug them in and match them up with um, maybe even plot some points just on a piece of scratch paper and then see if those points are matching up with various points on these graphs. For example, uh, between 7 and 10 a.m. we're being charged $3, so let's pick a time like 8 a.m. At 8 a.m. it should cost us $3. So. I'll go to my x-axis, I'm looking at 8 a.m. down here in my first example. There's 8 a.m. and am I coming up and looking at a charge of three dollars? I'm not. So it's probably not option A in this case. So go through the various multiple choice options and keep matching them up. Or some of you are going to be able to just read this and have a good understanding right away of what the graph should look like. And then we're being asked to locate the discontinuities. To answer this question, it'll be a lot easier once you have your graph. So places where you have asymptotes or holes or jumps in your y values, those would constitute points where you have discontinuities. And you're going to be answering using t values. In other words, x values, numbers that are going along your horizontal axis. And then again, once you have your correct graph, decide what types of discontinuities or type of discontinuities are manifesting on the graph. And then discuss the significance. <clears throat> I'm not going to read through all of those options. That'll be a good opportunity for you to kind of reflect back on the graph and do some interpretation, which is a good idea. Whether you're doing math homework or looking at some statistics or news that you're seeing on the internet or in a newspaper or a television news program, um, or in your studies of biology or sociology, um, good to be able to, to reflect on the data and, and interpret it yourself. In number three, use the definition of continuity and the properties of limits to show that the function is continuous at a equals negative one in this case. This is a very good exercise for you to go through because this is an example of a composite function. It has an inner function, which is x plus two times x to the fifth. And then the outer function is a raising to the fourth power. So f of x might be, you could say that it's equal to g of h of x maybe or you could say that f of x is equal to x to the fourth, and then g of x, which is your inner function, can be defined as x plus 2x to the five. So we're looking at continuity of the inner function and the outer function, and when you put an input value into the inner function, is it giving you an output value for which the outer function is also continuous. Let me say that one more time. Is the inner function continuous at this value? And if it is, when you plug in that value to the inner function, does that inner function give you an output value for which the outer function, or at which the outer function, is also continuous? You're looking at polynomials here, 
you're looking at, uh, these aren't even exponential functions. It's just raising to a power. Your variable is not in the exponent position, so it's not an exponential function. So really it's polynomials across the board here. So I think we're going to be in good shape as far as continuity is concerned. And we see that the conclusion is that the function is continuous at a equals negative 1. So that tells you a little bit about your destination. But march through these fill in the blanks and make some, de some determinations that will assist you in reaching that conclusion. And in number four, we have a piecewise function. And I like these problems because they really sort of step us through as we continue building our understanding of continuity. So here we see it broken down so that we're looking and examining continuity from the, or the limit as we approach from the left and the limit as we approach from the right for this particular a value of zero. And remember that we can't even say that a limit exists unless we can say that the limit from the left equals the limit from the right. And since we might just have a split here at an x value of zero, it's very important to examine the limit coming from the left and from the right. Now, as we're approaching from the left, approaching zero specifically from the left, <clears throat> that's where our x values are less than zero. So you'll need to determine the limit as x approaches zero from the left as pertains to the first part of your piecewise function. That might involve, you could put this function into a grapher, a graphing calculator or in a free online grapher like Desmos and examine what the function is doing as you approach an x value of zero from the left. And then separately you could put in this function, or sorry, uh, as you're approaching from the right, which is where x values are greater than zero, you'll want to be looking at the function x to the fourth, but only the part of the function that is at x equals zero and to the right of x equals zero. So see what those two functions look like there. Uh, see what those two functions look like they're trending toward as far as y values are concerned. And those are the numbers that you're going to be going in to answer these two questions. And once you have an answer to those, it's looking to me like the function is discontinuous. So this gives us an opportunity to articulate, well, all right, based on what those two numbers are, we're going to say that the function is discontinuous. And I'm going to let you select from those drop downs. And then if you did take the time to put those functions into a grapher, you'll be able to very easily see which one of these multiple choice options describes or illustrates the piecewise function. Could you do that without a graphing utility? You could. You would just have to plug in some x values. Uh, maybe I would use, uh, for the first part of the piecewise function, use an x value of negative 2, negative 1, and then maybe negative 0.5, maybe negative 0.1, something that gets you in pretty close to, but to the left of, an x value of 0. And then use a similar strategy as you're trying to graph the second piece, maybe an x value of 2, an x value of 1, and then 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and, and actually that function is defined, uh, the second piece there is defined for x equals zero, so you could plug in an x value of zero and plot that point as well. So that's sort of a, a manual point plotting method for determining which of these graphs correctly represents that piecewise function. Number five is a question that is very much about what we talked during the first half of the video. Here we have a rational function, and I will tell you that the numerator of this function is factorable, and you have to recall what is it that I'm supposed to do in order to remove a discontinuity. And remember, 
that a removable discontinuity is going to manifest as a whole. And so we want to figure out 3 comma what y value would end up plugging that hole and allowing this rational function to still be a continuous function. So refer back to the earlier part of this video if you need a hand with that. And then here we want to use continuity to evaluate the limit. And it's interesting, it doesn't seem like we're being given a whole lot of information here, but let's just work our way from the inside out and talk about continuity. If I had a function, maybe just say y equals x, can you imagine what the graph of that would look like? y equals x. You should know what it looks like. Would you describe that graph as being continuous? Could you draw the entire graph without picking up your pencil off of the paper? I would say yes. And then, what about the sine function? Do we know what that graph looks like? Are there any restrictions on the domain of the sine function? Or is it a smooth and continuous wave that goes forever in both directions? And then here we're seeing x again. Is that a continuous function? We already came to the conclusion that it is. So now, is it reasonable for me to say that a continuous function plus a continuous function is a continuous function? That's one of the, I think they were called properties, that we saw in the very early part of this video as we were scrolling through the pre-printed notes that f of x plus g of x, or f plus g, if they're both continuous, that's going to result in a continuous function. And what about this outer function, sine? Is that a continuous function? We already said yes. So you've got a continuous function inside of a continuous function that's being multiplied by a constant, so that we saw that as c times f. As long as f is continuous, when you multiply it by a constant value, it's still going to be continuous. So if it's continuous everywhere, it's this function right here sounds to me like it's continuous. And if it is, if you're working with a continuous function, remember that the limit as x approaches some number a should equal, or must equal is what I should say, the limit as x approaches a for your function will equal f of a if it's a continuous function. Therefore, if this is a continuous function, then this limit should equal f of pi. Now all you have to do is evaluate that function at pi. Enjoy that. Shouldn't be too difficult. Just take it one piece at a time, work your way from the inside to the outside of the function, evaluating bits and pieces as you go along. In number seven, for what value of the constant c is the function f continuous on the whole interval? We're looking at continuity on the entire interval because once we have a c value, this is going to be a polynomial. And polynomials are continuous for all real numbers. And the second half of our piecewise function is also a polynomial. So it will be continuous on the entire um, set of real numbers. All right, uh, so in order for it to be continuous everywhere, we need for the limit as this function approaches 3 from the left to equal the limit as x approaches 3 for this function from the right. Because this is looking at x values greater than or equal to 3, and the first one was looking at x values that are less than 3. So let's look at the first one. The limit as x approaches 3 from the left, and we're taking the limit of c of x squared plus 6x, 
And since this is a polynomial with an unknown constant, c, involved in it, but it still going to, is a polynomial and is going to be a more complete polynomial, we can evaluate this limit by direct substitution. So let's plug in a 3 for x. c times 3 squared plus 6 times 3. Okay, so that's equal to 9c plus 18. So all of that pertains to the first of our pieces. Now I want you to evaluate the limit as x approaches 3 from the right for this polynomial. Evaluate by direct substitution. And then you will have not just the limit from the left, but you'll have another expression that represents the limit from the right. And it's going to have the letter c in it. And remember that in order to have continuity here, we need for the limit from the left to equal the limit from the right. So you'll need to set those two limit statements equal to each other and then find our mystery C value. And finally, an intermediate value theorem question. Told you that was going to be an important theorem, not just in general, but also for working on this homework assignment and looking through these examples. We're being given a function here in the top left, right, I should do that left handed, Blah, right there. x to the fourth plus x minus four equals zero. So it's not just a function, but we're being told that the function is equal to zero. When is it equal to zero? For what x value? I don't know, but that's not the question here. The question here is, the x value that would cause this thing to equal zero, does it live somewhere on this interval from one to two? Again, is there an x value between one and two that would cause the left-hand side of this statement to indeed equal zero? And you can make that determination by checking and seeing what's happening when your x value is equal to 1. Does it put you up here? And at when x is equal to 2, does it put you down here? If it does, then somewhere between 1 and 2, your continuous function is going to cross the x-axis at a point that has a y value of... zero, an output value of zero. It's also possible that when x is equal to one, you're below the x-axis, and when x is equal to two, you're above the x-axis, and maybe that's how you're able to, or those are the two sort of um, y values that indicate to you that this function does indeed have a zero, or a root, between one and two. So do some calculations and make your determinations on that intermediate value theorem question. And then I will see you again in chapter six or section six, chapter two. Thanks so much. See you there.